from the Fargonauts here today. I got a special rank down for you today. Um, I don't know, about a year ago, not quite a year ago, but getting close, I walked over to Derek's apartment and found him watching the 14th Land Before Time movie, Journey of the Brave, which had just come out. My reaction was probably similar to yours. There's 14 of these movies? I remember there being nine. I think I saw the first nine when I was growing up. There's 14 now? That That's crazy. Okay, so I sat down and watched it, and I just caught the end of it. I'm like, okay, this seems okay. Well, let's go watch the first one. Derek, it's on Netflix. Let's watch it. And we did, and I loved it. So I'm like, you know what? There's 14 of these movies. Let's watch them all and do a rank down. And that was like the worst idea I've ever had because most of them are awful. So today I'm going to give you a rank down of the 14 Land Before Time movies from, we'll go from best to worst because I enjoy trash talking the worst ones a lot more than talking about what's good in the series. So without further ado, let's get started. Number one is obvious. It's the first one. The first Land Before Time is incredible. Like, go back and watch it. The only problem with it is it's too short. It is an amazing movie. It is so dark. Like, I can't believe this movie's for kids. It's crazy. It is really dark. Gritty, brutal, sad, traumatic. Wow. It's so good. Seriously, the first one, they stop it right there. I mean, some of the sequels are, are decent, but by far and away, number one is the best one. And it's all downhill from here, honestly. Number two, Land Before Time 5, The Mysterious Island. This was actually pretty fun. All the sequels are musicals, so, you know, whatever. But the songs in this one are pretty good. Um, it's got an interesting plot. You know, there's there's stuff, there's stuff at stake here. They, they, the Great Valley has run out of food. They have to find more food, otherwise they're all going to starve to death. And when we get Chomper, the T-Rex, everybody's favorites, back, that's always fun. And really, it's just a, it's a fun sequel. I was pretty surprised. I remember liking it when I was a kid. I'm, I'm glad to see I had good taste. Number three, Land Before Time 2, The Great Valley Adventure. So the second one in the series. Uh, it's, a lot of it's nostalgia, because I really loved this movie growing up. And the songs are kind of catchy and fun. You got the bad guys and the egg stealers who are, you know, they're fun villains. You know, they got more personality than just a sharp tooth. The Great Valley Adventure, nowhere near good as, as good as the first one. But it's still a fun movie. It's still, you know, it's got the probably mostly nostalgia. But there's still stuff at stake. And it's still got dark moments. Like going out in the mysterious beyond. Finding corpses, skeletons, and stuff. You know, it's still got the darkness, you know, that we're going to lose pretty rapidly. But I still like number two. Number four. Line before time three. Time of the Great Giving. This is where we're starting to get a little more corny and cheesy. Some of the songs are a little like, eh, this is definitely for little kids now. Uh, but that said, the, the third act has a battle with Velociraptors, and that is really well done. Like, the stakes are there, they, 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 it feels like they're in danger. Which is not what I can say about the later movies in the series. But, you know, that said, I still like the third one. It's got its flaws for sure, but, you know, at this point, there's still enough good things that I'm like, okay, I'm on board with the, what they're doing here. So, I like the third one. Number five, Nine Before Time, part ten. The Great Long Neck Migration. Now, I was surprised with this, honestly, uh, because I hadn't seen this one growing up. I'm like, oh, I bet you this is where they start to get bad, because some of the, you know, like, ones before this weren't very goody, and I had liked those when I was a kid, but I'd never seen 10. Holy crap, I was I was shocked at how good it was. It's not as good as some of the other ones, but dang, like, they, they, they tried. They introduced some new characters, and they tie everything back to the first one. Spoilers, they bring back Littlefoot's dad, played by Kiefer Sutherland. Of all people. It's crazy. But we have a well-structured third act, a final battle that's actually pretty fun, really well done, lots of interesting new characters, an interesting plot actually. Um, it, you know, it's not a perfect movie by any means because it's a straight-to-DVD kids movie sequel, but that said, I'm, I'm shocked. You know, this movie and Up, great. Like, I watched them again, no problem. And I'm just really genuinely surprised how good this was. And that just makes it so much worse about some of these later sequels, like how low it goes. Because they proved they can make a good straight-to-DVD sequel. What's wrong? You know, what, what happened with the rest of them? I don't know. You did it once, do it again. Number six, Land Before Time 7, Stone of Cold Fire. And this is what I would say is the last good movie in the series. The rest of them are kind of like, eh, it's just alright shit. Uh, but the Stone of Cold Fire... I didn't really like this one when I was a kid. I remember growing up and like, eh, about this one. 
But it actually is a really good message. The main antagonist of the movie is Petrie's uncle, uh, Toronto. And basically the message is just because someone's family doesn't make them a good person. You know, give them a second chance, but that doesn't mean you, you always have to trust them. You know, it, it's basically the message is think for yourself. That, that's the message throughout the whole thing. Don't necessarily believe what you're told. Think for yourself. Figure it out for yourself. Ask questions. And don't necessarily trust somebody because they're family. Those are all really good messages and really surprising for a kid's movie. You know, I was really shocked. And there were some, you know, interesting parts uh, with the villains. You know, Toronto might be the most complex villain they've ever had in the series. Because he is Petrie's uncle. He does care about Petrie. But he also is very arrogant, narcissistic, and thinks his way is best. And he's wrong. And he gets people killed for that. You know, it happens off screen. But he, there's a flashback sequence where he gets a bunch of people or dinosaurs killed. It's... It's, it's a little, it's shown in a light manner, but it's still fairly dark for, you know, kids movie. And this might be the last time they ever get dark in the series. Uh, but surprisingly good and a really great message. So, but that's pretty much the end of the praise I have for this series. So here we go. Number seven, Lime Before Time, part four, Journey Through the Mist. I remember really liking this movie when I was a kid. And boy, I was really disappointed. Um, it's not necessarily a bad movie, per se. It's just not super interesting. We meet some new side characters, uh, like Tickles the Mouse, I think is pretty funny, and Archie, and whatever the female long deck's name is, I can't remember her name, whatever. And they're all fine, and the vil the one good thing I will say is the villains are really funny. Itchy, and pff, Itchy the Bird and the Alligator, I can't remember her name either. But apart from the villains, nothing else is super interesting, it's just they're going on a quest, and stuff's happening, and it's, it's fine. It's, it's not... Good, not bad. It's just it's a movie. So, yeah, it's a, I probably wouldn't watch it again, but it's it's you know it's whatever. Number eight, Land Before Time, Part Six: The Secret of Soros Rock. Again, this one's fine. It's it's fine. It's nothing special. Um, the biggest problem is uh, Sarah's got two little cousins, um, Dinah and Dana, who are super annoying in this movie. This kind of starts the trend of really annoying guest star characters, and boy are they bad. And they cause like all the problems in this, uh, this movie, so luckily they never show up again, but they're awful. Like, oof. No thank you. Never again. You know, music's okay. Stuff that happens is okay. It, it's, it, again, it's another one where it's not bad, per se, but it's not good either. It's just, it's a movie. Eh. Number nine, Lab Before Time and the Big Freeze. I loved this movie when I was a kid. Really, I think it was just because, ooh, dinosaurs and snow, that's cool. Nah, it's pretty boring, actually. I mean, it, that's the a big problem. It's just not that interesting. It's boring. Not a whole lot happens. It, they beat a T-Rex off with snowballs. Being okay, cool. But apart from that, it's just not interesting. It's, it's just generally a pretty boring movie. Number 10, The Land Before Time, Part 9, Journey to Big Water. I've seen this one once before, and I saw this one time. I wasn't a big fan of it. Uh, the character Mo, the fish guy they're helping get back to the water, is very annoying. Even the characters in the movie find him annoying. I mean, it's a, it's a quest. They're off on a quest. They're taking him back to Big Water. I mean, the third act is okay, I guess. A little different, because the, the bad guy they're fighting is a water sharp tooth. So that's, that's a little, it's a little different, so the third act is okay. And they sing one song that's a, a kind of a flashback to the fifth movie, the Big, 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 Big Water song, which is a fun song, arguably, I think, the best one in the series. But the rest of the movie just sucks, pretty much. I mean, Mo is so annoying, and it really, besides the third act and that song, nothing else is interesting in this movie. In fact, it's less than interesting. It's annoying, more annoying than anything. So that's why this is lower than eight, which is just boring. This one was more annoying. Higher highs, but lower lows than eight. Number 11, The Land Before Time, 14, A Journey of the Brave, which is the movie that started all of this nonsense. Um, so that's the newest one. It was made seven years after the 13th one, so it's been a while. And, you know, if you've noticed, 11, 12, and 13 have, are the last three. So, I mean, it's definitely a step up from those three, but really it's, uh, it's another boring one. It's nothing we haven't seen before. Everything that happens in this movie has been done before. The only interesting thing is they bring back Littlefoot's dad. And even that is meh. I mean, it gives Littlefoot some motivation, which, you know, there's actually something at stake, which can't be said for the next three movies in the series. You know, okay, so we got motivation to go on a quest. Okay, great. And that's really all we have. 
It's really a boring movie. Uh, Reba McIntyre plays a pterodactyl. Damon Williams Jr. plays a guy named Wild Arms. Okay, I mean, it's not offensively bad, like what we're about to see, but it's still pretty bad. It's just boring. And boring is not good. Number 12, Lamb for Time, Part 11, The Invasion of the Tiny Sources. Easily the worst title in the series, and I honestly thought this was going to be the worst one. I don't think it, I was, when I first watched it, I'm like, it cannot get worse than this. Yeah, it can. So, the whole plot of this movie is the valley's invaded by a little tiny long necks, the yay big. And at first, I thought Littlefoot hits his head earlier in the movie. And at first, he's the only one interacting with these things. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, so he's just hallucinating. And they seem to be causing all the problems. I'm thinking, well, what if Littlefoot actually caused all these problems? And he's just hallucinating or, or, or maybe lying or something, making up a fib. Like, that's what I thought the direction was. No, nope. Turns out all these little guys are real. Somehow, there's just little tiny dinosaurs. Whatever, okay, stupid. And the, but there's really nothing at stake once they figure that out. Until the very end, when they're forcing the little guys out of the valley. Oh no, they're sharp teeth. Oh no. Again. And so, the whole movie, there's nothing at stake until the third act. So, it, it's, it's really dumb. It's a really dumb plot. And I just can't believe it gets worse. Because this was pretty fucking awful. Number 13, The Land Before Time, Part 12, The Great Day of the Flyers. <sighs> this is bad. This is real bad. The biggest problem in this movie is there's absolutely nothing at stake. A new dinosaur comes to the valley. No one really knows what he is. It turns out he's a flyer, spoiler alert. I mean, it's kind of obvious he's got wings the whole time. But basically, it's just Petrie's learning how to fly better, like information. Okay, that's the first half, half of the movie, and then eventually the new guy goes, I think his name's Guido, goes sleepwalking, and they have to just protect him from falling to his death. That's like the big problem. He actually sleepwalks in the Mysterious Beyond, and they gotta like rescue his ass and get him out of there. That's the, that's the, that's what's at stake? Who cares? We just met this guy. We don't care about this character at all. And then why does it matter if Petrie can fly in formation? It doesn't matter, and at the end it doesn't matter anyway, he does his own thing. Everybody's like, oh, we should all be individuals and not fly information. Okay, great, but what the hell was the point of this? Why did we have to sit through an hour and 15 minutes of this crap? Why did I do it? I don't know, I guess I hate myself, but jeez, there, there's nothing at stake. There's nothing at stake. <sighs> Stupid waste of time. And yet, somehow, there is something worse. Brace yourselves. Number 14, and last, the worst movie in the Lamb Before Time series, is part 13, The Wisdom of Friends, guest starring Cuba Gooding Jr. Oscar award winning Cuba Gooding Jr. Yeah, here we go. The plot of this movie is Littlefoot and the gang meet Cuba Gooding Jr.'s character and two others of a species. Oh, they're called Yellow Bellies. And they are pretty much the dumbest things in existence. There's no reason they should still be alive. With how dangerous this world is, they were out in the mysterious beyond. This world is so dangerous they could get eaten at any time. There's so many things that can kill these guys. They're, they have no business still being alive. They are the dumbest things ever. They can't follow simple instructions. So, the plot of the movie is Littlefoot and the Gang is trying to keep these guys alive. Basically teach them how to survive. Even though they've been somehow doing this on their own. All this happens because Littlefoot uh, is out standing on a log which falls one day. Uh, his grandma manages to save him and she falls down the cliff, but somehow she's a freaking long neck with no claws, massive thing, somehow grabs out of the side of the cliff and pulls herself off. There's no way, there's no way that happened. Make her fall. That she can live, maybe, maybe break a leg, I don't know, but there's no way she grabbed onto the side of a cliff. Impossible. So Littlefoot becomes like, oh, we gotta follow the rules now, because otherwise we'll die. Okay, fine. Well, these new yellow belly things, they don't they don't get it. So they're trying to explain just the most simple rules to them and help them find their herd again. For example, stay in a group. They can't even do that. They keep getting separated and lost, and that's like all the conflict of the movie. But Littlefoot and the game take him to the edge of the mysterious beyond. 
and direct him like, hey, that's the rock you said you guys were looking for. That's where your herd's going to be. Okay, good luck. And they, the, the gang leaves them and they're like, you know what? They're probably going to die unless we help them. Should we help them? Ugh, I don't want to, but I will. So they help them get to the rock and they eat up their herd. And the whole herd is just as dumb as the rest of them. So, of course, they do a, a sing and dance night. It's just the worst thing ever. Um, and then they decide, oh, we're off to a place called... So look for the guy's like, okay, it's probably that way. Good luck. Oh, wait, they're probably going to die unless we help them. So they go help them and get, help them get to Berry Valley. Well, almost. They get to a place that looks like Berry Valley. It isn't. And they're like, okay, we need to find the really bar real Berry Valley. The gang's like, all right, well, good luck. Oh, wait. You're probably going to die unless we help you. So they're almost to Berry Valley. They get up on these cliffs. Spoilers. I'm, don't worry, I'm saving you. Uh, and these four sharp teeth attack them, right? Now, how do they overcome this? How do they, how do they, so, oh, and the reason why the, the sharp teeth managed to catch up to them is because one of the stupid yellow bellies couldn't follow the direction to stay in a group, wandered off on their own, and they had to go back and get her. Well, the yellow bellies decide the best way to defeat these guys is by doing their dance number they did when they were all reunited, which involves them basically jumping up and down. They're huge, they're big. And all the jumping up and down causes the cliff that the sharp teeth are standing on to break and fall off, and they fall off a cliff and presumably die. They dance the sharp teeth to death. That happens. That's how they win. That's how they, they save the day. And not only that, their one skill that they use to survive is they can make themselves look like a bush by slamming their head into the ground, burying the sand, and sticking their butt up in the air, and they look like a bush. That's how they survive. Unfortunately, that only works if the ground is soft. So many times during the movie, they just beat their heads into the ground, wham, trying to stick their heads into the ground. But they can't. They just get dizzy instead because they hit their head on a stupid rock. Yeah! None of these creatures have any business surviving, so we have to spend an entire hour and 15 minutes or whatever dealing with their BS trying to live when they shouldn't be all because Littlefoot the gang just kind of feels too bad to abandon them. And there's a certain point where it's just like, you know what? Screw you guys, I'm going home because I ain't dealing with this crap no more. It is... <sighs> I'm going to go ahead and say this. The Land Before Time 13 is the worst movie I've ever seen in my life. I've seen a lot of bad movies. I've given out maybe two or three zeros, perfect zeros, in my life for a movie. This is one of them. And I say out of the two or three that I have given out, this one is the worst. This is the worst movie I have ever seen. So do yourself a favor. Do not watch it. Do not think about it. Destroy it if you see it. Do the world a favor. This should not exist. Please. That is what I discovered on my Land Before Time watch through. The lowest low ever. I'm sorry. I just had to get that off my chest. So that's the Land Before Time series. There's only about six worth watching. Uh, one, two, three, five, seven, and ten are the only ones worth your time at all. The rest of them range from meh to like, oh my god, let it end. So, that was fun. I hope you had more fun than I did. I mean, you only had to sit here for 22 minutes while I spent countless hours doing this crap. Just so you won't have to. You're welcome, world. Anyway, that's Ryan from the Fargonauts. Who knows what I'm going to rank down next? It'll probably be awful. Until then, have a good one. <laughs>